So good evening. My name is David Young. I'm the superintendent here in South Burlington. And I want to welcome you to the community information meeting to talk about master planning and visioning. And um, again, you see a lot of information around the room. And um, in just a minute, we'll begin a presentation. But before we do, I just want to just, uh, you, call, you saw some of the board members up front. We just actually called the meeting to order. So it's a public meeting. Um, and I um, wanted to let you know that. I do want to just recognize we've got some folks in the room. So school board members, uh, uh, Elizabeth Fitzgerald, the chair of our school board. Bridget Burkhart, our clerk, and you're going to hear from her. Alex McHenry is over here. And Brian Minier is here. Martin Malone is not with us. Also, uh, we've got some administrators in the room. Patrick Burke here in the, in the back, principal of the high school. Uh, we've got Karsten Slender in the back of the room as well. He's the middle school principal. Gary Marcus, our operations and finance. And this is always dangerous when you miss some people. And we also have uh, Dor Whittier from here, Lee Dor, and Rob Fitzgerald in the back, and you'll have an opportunity to meet their table uh, this evening. So um, again, first and foremost, thanks for being here. Um, we're going to provide you with an overview. Bridget is going to do that with an overview of where we are. Um, and then we have opportunity to kind of allow you to move around the room and ask questions um, to either architect related questions, school board related questions, finance related questions, and you'll have an opportunity again to move around the room. Our hope is at the end of the night you'll have additional information in, in order for you to make an informed decision on March 3rd. Uh, there's an awful lot of information available on our website. Um, we'll have some here for you tonight and we'll make sure you get that information. So without further ado, again, I'm going to turn it over to Bridget to walk you through uh, where we are. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, David. Thank you all of you for coming out tonight. I know evening meetings can be tough with all the other activities and things going on, so we really appreciate the turnout. It's great to see so many of you. So as David said, we're going to be talking about the middle school and high school project. Uh, we're going to cover how we got here, uh, what our process was for coming to a decision about what kind of project we were going to propose to the community. We're going to talk about the need for the project, the project itself, a brief overview of that, um, the cost and the timing. As David said, I'll make a presentation. Um, board members will be at this table up here afterwards um, to answer any board-related questions about our decision-making process. Uh, Gary Marcus and David will be up here to talk about finances and taxpayer impacts. Uh, in the very back, the architects will be there to get into more detail about the features of the schools and the design and Pat Burke uh, will be uh, in the back at a separate table to talk about academic issues, athletic issues, and school climate issues. So that is the, the structure for the evening. So how did we get here? Back in 2008, uh, the school district decided it needed to take a more proactive approach to stewardship of all five of our school buildings. So we developed, the, I shouldn't say we, I should say the people who were in the district at the time, uh, this was before my time, developed a long-term stewardship plan. The idea was to have this rolling 10-year stewardship plan uh, where we mapped out all the expenses that we knew were going to come up at the five buildings. Um, we did that. Uh, we kept that up to date. We kept doing those stewardship projects. What we were finding, though, as time went on, is that more and more of the projects, the bigger ones, we kept having to reschedule. They were too big to do in an annual budget, or they would be too disruptive because they would take longer than a summer. So things like a new high school cafeteria. You're sitting in one of our cafeterias tonight. We've known for a long time that we don't have enough cafeteria space, for example. That kind of project kept getting put off and put off and put off. Um, so after we closed the master planning and visioning process for the elementary schools, which some of you remember and some of you are part of, that wrapped up in 2016 and out of that process really came uh, the, the sense that what really needed focus was the middle school and high school. That the community was happy with those elementary schools where they were, um, but we really need to focus especially on the high school, but a lot of needs the middle school as well. So we undertook a two-year process. Um, and the first phase of that process, our phase one process, was really to just assess what we have structurally. So it was to take a deep look with engineers at what was happening at the middle school and high school. That phase one study had many different uh, elements to it. I won't go through all of these lines in detail. The presentation will be available later on if you have questions. Um, but it wrapped up in April of 2018. And what that study told us is that there are some pretty serious issues with the buildings, that we've taken good care of them, uh, but some of the major systems uh, that would require significant renovation 
taking longer than a summer, uh, really needed to be addressed and addressed in the next few years. So that led into the phase two of the study, which was really to focus on our educational needs as a district now and trying to look out as far as we could into the future, knowing that educational needs change over time. Um, and then after we sort of assessed where we are now, um, how the buildings are supporting or not supporting that vision uh, for education of the community's students. As you can see, there were a lot of different steps. There were a lot of visioning sessions. There were a lot of community input sessions. There were days and days spent with faculty and staff and students um, at both of the schools, led by the principals, led by um, the administrators, and uh, supported by the architects to determine what we really needed to support education in the district. At the end of the phase two study, which wrapped up in April of 2019, so almost a year ago now, um, the architects had developed for us um, eight different options for how we could address both the infrastructure needs and the educational needs uh, that we found in those two studies. Those options uh, ranged all the way from renovate the infrastructure only, which would be sort of taking out walls, ceilings, those kinds of things, completely redoing HVAC, plumbing, electrical systems, those kinds of things, and then putting it all back pretty much the way it was, not really expanding the buildings or adding anything else to them or changing configuration, but just doing the things we needed to make the buildings live longer. Um, all the way up through new construction, the options in the middle were, um, option two here was really to focus on some of the highest level needs, the, the highest priority needs at each of the two schools. Unfortunately, those highest needs when you look at them are not necessarily the classroom spaces, it's really having enough space for the students. So they focused on things like gyms and cafeterias. So the top three at the high school were gym, cafeteria, and science spaces. At the middle school, there was a little bit of um, reconfiguration of classrooms uh, at a very high level, um, as well as cafeteria and gym space. Full renovations and additions to get all the educational improvements that we had identified as being necessary in the district over the long term um, were options three through, uh, three through seven, I guess three through six, sorry. And then options seven and eight were new construction. At the same time, in April of last year, they provided us with a very high level comparative set of costs. So these were not completely schematic drawings, they hadn't been sent off uh, for a very detailed look, but these were meant to be sort of apples to apples costs. Cost estimator did help with it, but it was basically based on you know, the type of things we were thinking about doing in each of these scenarios, the square footage we would address, those kinds of things. We knew that these were not sort of final costs, but they were meant to allow the board to pick a direction and really develop that direction further because the design process itself is pretty extensive and expensive. So to run two different design processes at the same time would not really be feasible for the district. As we assessed all of those different options, the board looked at sort of six buckets of things. There are lots of detailed questions underneath them, um, but those included Number one, does the option support educational goals, including student health and wellness? Number two, what is the best location on the site? So all of these different options came with different locations on the site, and how that affected approach and circulation and access to field space and other things on the site. Which one best supports community use? The community uses our buildings a lot. They are public buildings, so when the students aren't in them, the community uses them for sports and beyond sports as well. There are classes and things that run in the high school classrooms when the students aren't there, those kinds of things. Which is the least disruptive to students during construction? And in talking to other districts that have been through a similar process, we were told in no uncertain terms not to discount this issue because that construction of any kind um, can be very disruptive to students. What is the impact on busing, traffic, school programs, and the environment was all kind of another bucket of things we looked at. And what are the costs versus value added to students and community? So obviously there were some higher cost projects and some lower cost projects. And as a board, we really had to look into what the value was that came out of each of those projects and weigh that cost benefit. So I just wanted to flash up for you a, a, a renovation example. This is what an infrastructure renovation kind of looks like, just to give people a picture in their mind as we go through this, the rest of the presentation. So the need uh, for doing anything. Um, I think all of us board members came to this process kind of hoping that the need would be pretty small and that we would be able to just continue to address it in a series of one or two million dollar bonds um, every few years over the course of time. That is not what we found. So for infrastructure, we found, as I said, the buildings are well maintained, but at the end of their usable lives, meaning that some of the bigger infrastructure systems are at the end of their usable lives. They need to be replaced. 
Uh, that includes things like HVAC, plumbing, fire protection. We aren't even fully sprinklered in the high school. So the addition that was put onto the high school in 1977 is sprinklered, but the rest of the high school is not. Those kinds of things. Um, accessibility is a real challenge for students with physical disabilities. And site circulation and parking are pretty hazardous. Anybody who's been here at pickup or drop off time, but particularly pickup time in the afternoon, will attest to the conflict between buses and cars and pedestrians that goes on. So this just gives you a sense of how old our buildings are. So the high school was built in 1960, um, and the main part of the high school um, has, is 60 years old and has had no significant renovations. Small things um, like changes in windows, um, obviously some paint, those kinds of things, but no significant structural renovations. There was an addition, as I said, that was put on in 1977, so that's 43 years old with no significant renovations of that since it was built. The middle school was built in 1968, so it's 52 years old without significant work on it. So the question is, how long do we wait? And how do we best approach stewardship needs and educational needs to really lay the groundwork for the next three or four generations of South Burlington students over the next 60 or 70 years? Construction costs are continuing to rise at a, a rate that's much higher than inflation, so four to six percent a year is what we're seeing in New England and really across the country when it comes to school construction. Uh, stewardship of the buildings is still necessary at this stage. So the longer we wait, the longer we have to do some critical things. An example is, you know, just before I came on the board, we put in a new elevator at the high school. There was really not a choice in doing that in terms of complying with, uh, with ADA and those kinds of things. Those kinds of projects will have to continue to happen up until we do something that addresses things holistically. And we know that teaching and learning has changed significantly since the 1960s when these buildings were built. Um, we do not just lecture to students and hope that they can regurgitate that information on a test anymore. And we'll talk a little bit more about the educational model in just a minute. One of the issues that we really focused on as we started off the process was how big uh, a building do we really need going out 60 or 70 years. Unlike a lot of the state of Vermont, South Burlington is growing, and we are seeing growing enrollment uh, in the district. We have a demographer who updates projections every couple of years, and what we're expecting is that we will add at least another 125 students over the next 10 years. That's to the 925 that we already have at the high school, so I'm just talking about the high school for the moment, and the high school is already over capacity, so we're about 4% over capacity today. That 125 students would put us at about 1,050 students, which would be about 18% over capacity. So this overcrowding has led to crowded cafeterias. You can kind of see what lunch looks like. Even though we have three different lunch cycles, we still have very crowded cafeterias. You'll see if you come to the high school, kids eating on the stairs, eating you know, in little corners because there just isn't space for everyone. Um, this is sort of down in the bottom here is sort of what it looks like in the hallway as at passing time between classes. Um, it's very crowded, especially at the pinch points where the addition was put on, which are very narrow. Um, we also have had to sort of build on some temporary space to house things like our walk-in freezer for our kitchen because there's not enough space to put it inside. And our IT infrastructure is also in a little modular building that was moved over from Forchard a few years ago. So when we talk about the educational model, what we hear from employers and what we hear from, uh, from college professors that are teaching right now, students are expected to look different than they did 60 years ago when these buildings were built. They're expected to be, first and foremost, effective communicators, critical thinkers, collaborators, and problem solvers, and really be creative. I would add to this list, um, what we've also heard is lifelong learning is just so important because um, technology changes so fast that a lot of what gets taught in content can be out of date within two years. And so if you're not a lifelong learner, you're going to have a real challenge over the course of a long career. So in order to, to help students develop these skills and these attributes before they leave South Burlington, we need a slightly different educational model than the one that was here in the 1960s. Um, this is the actual floor plan for the high school, one of the classroom wings from the 1960s. And the red dots uh, at the front are the teacher, and then you have rows of desks. And the, the struggle that we have is that we know that we need different size classroom spaces for different activities, for project-based learning, for interdisciplinary learning. When we try to combine, for example, classes in social studies uh, and history together, and we have that number of students, a lot of our classrooms are undersized to do those kinds of things. 
we don't have small rooms for students to collaborate and work on projects uh, effectively, those kinds of things. At the same time, when the buildings were built in the 1960s, special education was done off-site. It wasn't done in the building for the most part. And that has changed significantly. Best practice has special education and those kinds of services integrated in the mainstream of the high school. And we need better spaces to do that and keep those services close to the rest of our classrooms. There are a lot of other issues. So these purple lines that are on here are structural load-bearing walls. And that's our challenge at the high school, one of our biggest challenges is that there are low bearing walls between each classroom. So reconfiguring those classrooms without doing something significant to the building is very hard, it's very expensive. We also have these sort of cinder block walls that we'll see in a minute when we talk about accessibility uh, that are part of this load bearing system um, that sort of what are called pocket doors around our doors, which makes it hard to get into a classroom um, if you were in a wheelchair, if you have some other physical disability. Um, in terms of the educational model, as I mentioned before, it is much more interdisciplinary, it's much more project-based. Students are expected to work a lot more independently, but with facilitation uh, from a teacher. And you can see, this is the, the first and second floor of our high school. Uh, the STEM disciplines, for example, are spread across the school. And these days, a lot of our work involves not only STEM, but STEAM. So it brings art and design into those kinds of project-based learnings. It's tricky if a student is working on a project that needs all of these disciplines, input from teachers in those different disciplines, input from other students who are working in those disciplines, because those things are so spread out across the building and on different floors. Um, the complication is much higher if you are in some way physically challenged. Um, so for example, the art room, if you're in a wheelchair, you have to go back and forth to the gym, which most likely has a PE class going on at any given moment in order to get to the art room from the rest of the building. Our elevator, if you go into it, you'd be surprised to know it has five floors because there are so many different additions or things that have been kind of added on. And just the way the building was built initially, it's very hard to get around if, if, you, um, if you have any kind of disability. This is just another picture that kind of shows the pocket doors that I was talking about. Our band and chorus rooms have these built-in risers, so um, students in wheelchairs can't sort of sit with the section that they would normally sing with or the, the section of the band that they would normally play with. And there are all these different parts of the high school with little sets of stairs um, that make it challenging. At the middle school, best practice has changed from a junior high school model, which is what was in place when the buildings were built in the 1960s, where students were in a homeroom and were going off to different departments uh, for their different disciplines, to a team-based model where four core teachers are sort of wrapped around 100 students, and they really focus as a team for any given year. Um, so these color-coded boxes sort of show the different rooms for each of the, the teams that are in the middle school right now. And they're spread out across the middle school in that way because different classes need different types of classrooms and, and facilities, and we can't really get those teams located together in the way that we would like to locate them. Um, this is sort of what we do for collaboration right now in the middle school. So the students are sitting in the hallway without the, the teacher being able to see them while they're working with the rest of the class inside the classroom. The other challenge is that different teams are on slightly different schedules sometimes. So these students are very happy right here now in the, in the hallway, but at change of class period for some other team, they may have students kind of walking through um, and walking through with muddy boots in the winter. Um, South Burlington is known for its sports programs, obviously. Uh, despite that, we really do have inadequate gym space to support those programs, even as they are today, uh, let alone with increasing enrollment. So the high school, we have such a small gymnasium. We have one competition size court that can kind of be divided up into two practice courts. But with all the teams that we have, those practices get stacked on top of each other. We've got students getting home quite late in the evening. It also means that there's not really space for community use, a lot of the high school gym. Um, because we're using it pretty much from the time we get here in the morning until quite late in the evening. The middle school gym, anyone who's been there to be at, a, at an athletic event knows uh, the pain of sitting along the wall or, or, or sort of hovering in the entryway trying to see those, those games. Um, our auditorium holds about 445 students uh, for a student body of 925 students at the high school. It makes it very hard to have all school assemblies because the only place to do that is in the gym, which means losing a couple of days of PE. We have to set up chairs on the gym floor um, and then break them down um, after our, our all school assemblies. So it's very rare that we get a chance to really bring the school all together. 
<clears throat> Not to mention, of course, that that makes it challenging um, for our performers as they're trying to do uh, performances. Our band and chorus rooms are located up on the second floor while our stage is down on the second, or on the first floor, sorry. So all of our big band instruments, all of the things that they need for a performance need to be brought down in the elevator and onto our stage. Um, at the middle school, um, in terms of health and wellness, uh, one of the things that has been raised as a concern by parents and staff over many years is the lack of natural light. So over 50% of the building, anything, oops, sorry, uh, anything with these red squares has no natural light. And a lot of the rooms that do have natural light have very narrow windows that really don't have a great connection with the outdoors. Um, this is a picture of our, our high school indoor track team practicing in the hallways. Um, we know that childhood obesity are on the rise, not just in the United States, but also in Vermont and here in South Burlington. And that physical activity and getting into those good lifelong habits is the way to combat that. Um, we know that physical activity also correlates positively with good academic outcomes. Um, and so focusing on the health and well-being of our students is important to make sure that they have success, uh, both here and as they go out into the world. Um, we only have the space to offer a year and a half of PE, and there are a lot of spaces for students to really go and get exercise on their own or with any kind of support outside of those PE classes. So safety, I already touched on this briefly with regard to parking lots and conflicts between traffic and pedestrians. Um, as I mentioned, we have a lack of fire protection um, in both schools. Uh, we have inconsistent heat in the high school. Students sort of carry their coats around with them all day because different classrooms are cold or warm, uh, depending on how the heat is working that day. And we know that there are hazardous materials in both schools. We've been working to remediate those bit by bit over time. And we know that they're okay as long as they stay in place and aren't disturbed. Um, but we know that they're there, especially um, in light of the recent lead testing that we did. We know that some of the water fountains and a couple of the sinks in the kitchens had lead levels that were higher than the new state standards. There's been a real push by staff to get those levels to absolute zero, which is a challenge without doing something more significant than changing faucets. Um, sustainability, the current buildings are heated by gas powered boilers and are not insulated to today's code. So if we were to do anything to the outside of the buildings, we would need to bring those envelopes up to at least code. Um, and it's challenging to retrofit a lot of the sustainability um, the sustainability systems just because of the infrastructure that we already have in the two schools. Um, and having two separate buildings means more maintenance and less efficiency in terms of sustainability. We know that sustainability is going to become an issue. Different states are already passing laws about you know, what public buildings need to do, especially if there's an opportunity like a renovation or something, and the standards are getting tighter and tighter as we move forward. Um, not to mention that uh, that we, that we want to be good stewards of the planet as we move forward. So after much discussion, um, the school board um, in June of 2019 uh, decided to go with option eight. Um, and I'll speak a little bit off the cuff here personally. For me, the idea of putting kids in trailers for multiple school years, having them in buildings that are being renovated, having them exposed to the dust and the noise and, and the chaos of renovation in the building where they're trying to learn is very unappealing. The other thing is that really, if we're gonna open these buildings up, put the community through the, the, the angst that comes along with these kind of projects, we really need to think about what kind of groundwork we're laying for the next 60 or 70 years. It'll be another several decades, I believe, that before we would get another chance to really address a lot of these issues. And so, while it's, it's painful and expensive, and we know that we're asking a lot of the community, I really believe, and the board voted unanimously, that it was time to really address this by building two new buildings. So in September of last year, um, the board voted unanimously to go with concept five. So our architects spent the summer working with faculty and staff and some community members um, to sort of develop different ways of going about building two new buildings, including they took another look at just doing infrastructure renovations at the middle school and doing a new high school. And again, the board really asked a lot of questions, had a lot of discussion, dived into those different plans, and we chose concept five for a lot of reasons. So concept five, as a lot of you probably know by now, is a new middle school, 145,700 square foot middle school, attached to a new high school, um, which is here in the middle, and a new physical education and athletic center. 
um, and in, in addition, extensive site work to change circulation, obviously to move the playing fields, those kinds of things. One of the key reasons we did this is that the contractor can come and put up a construction fence right across this half of the property. We could keep our middle school and our high school running at the same time, so the academic programs can go on uninterrupted. Obviously, there'd be some disruption to our athletic programs. Um, Pat Burke and Mike DeVore are already in conversations with UVM and other um, universities and spaces for athletic, um, athletic uh, uh, practice fields to try to find a home for each of our outdoor sports during the period that we would be under construction. The other thing that doing this in this way of putting the buildings on the back half does is it makes the construction period much shorter. So we would be expecting that there would be about a three year, eight month construction period for concept five versus some of the other ones where you needed to sort of build a new high school up here and then move students from the middle school into the existing high school and then do renovations at the middle school. Those kinds of projects take more like four or five years. So that's just a longer period of particularly one who might come onto the property at the beginning of this project and spend a lot of their middle and high school years under construction. So I'll walk a little bit through some of the floor plans. As I said at the outset, when you're in the back, they have a lot more pictures, a lot more um, posters back there, and can talk a little bit more in detail about the features, but I'll touch on some of the high level ones. Um, most of you are familiar, I'm sure, with our site. So you know that on the southern end, which is this end of our, of our picture here, uh, the right side, the south side, our site drops off. Right now we have what we call our tundra field, affectionately, which is our grass uh, turf field. Um, and it's lower than the rest of the property. And we're taking advantage of that in this design by putting the first level of the physical education and athletic center there. The physical education and athletic center includes all the spaces that would normally be programmed into the high school. So it has the basketball courts, as you can see here, one of them would be a competition court, the others would be a multi-surface that could be used for other sports as well. We could cover up the competition court when other sports were using the physical education and athletic center. We could potentially roll turf in it if we decided to invest in that kind of thing so that um, outdoor sports could use it to sort of get a little head start on the season or extend the season in terms of practice. Um, the Physical Education and Athletic Center also includes things like health classrooms. It's really a cluster for health and wellness and athletics. It would include um, a 1,100 seat set of bleachers that could be pulled out, so that would seat our whole student body and would allow for all school assemblies. It would also allow us to bring at, um, graduation back to campus, so it's been a safe mic for many, many years because we just don't have enough space to do graduation on campus. And it would also be a space that something like this because um, there will be fewer um, hours late into the evening that the students will be on there. There's a potential for basketball leagues, those kinds of things, or running or walking before the students are here in the morning. We would have to map out exactly how that would work. Before I show you the, the floor plan for the first floor of the, the classroom buildings, I just wanted to go back to the concept of adjacencies that we touched on earlier. So the idea to support the teaching model is really to develop clusters of classrooms in interrelated disciplines around what we're calling extended learning areas. This is kind of best practice in school construction right now. So for example, we would have a, um, a business and career um, uh, hub that would include our big picture program, our school within a school um, around an extended learning area that would feed right into the tech and engineering and fab lab spaces and would have access from the art spaces as well. Um, we would have STEM hubs on the different floors of one wing of our classroom uh, building. Or, and we really believe, um, and the research shows, that these kinds of hubs um, promote collaboration and teamwork and problem solving and student engagement. And this is one thing we've had a little bit of, of um, questions about, I would say, about student engagement. One of the things that we've heard is, hey, all education takes, it doesn't take a fancy building, it just takes an engaged teacher and an engaged student. And that may be true. The challenge that we have as a public institution is not all students are engaged. Our school and the setup that it's in right now doesn't work for everybody. It doesn't meet their needs. It doesn't speak to them. And when students disengage, it's very hard to reach them. It's very hard to get them excited about learning and keep them working toward the goals that we are hoping for as a community for them. 
So you can see the design for both schools is set up around that concept. So this is the middle school over here. So you can see the little pods for the different teams. This would be a two-story wing. Um, so each grade would have two stories, um, two teams per grade. Um, so the four core classes plus what we've done in the design is add on one of the special classes. Um, because we did have feedback from students that they really like the team concept. They like having an extended learning area that kind of acts as the living room, if you will, for the team, where they can work on projects, where they can have team meetings and those kinds of things. But they also wanted to make sure that they could see, at some point during the day, their friends from other teams. And the way that we have incorporated that into the, that feedback into the design is to put a special classroom at the end of each pod. So here it's health, for example. Over here, um, it's one of the, the special education classrooms. Over here, it's one of the world language classrooms. That way they do get to mix with each other in the halls and see each other a little bit during the day. At the high school, you can see those extended learning areas over here. So this is the, the science wing, the STEM wing, and you have the, the science and math and engineering classrooms surrounding an ELA. And then down here, that feeds right into technical fabrication spaces. So there are a few of those spaces, each one's sort of designed to work with different materials. So there would be wood, there would be uh, metal and robotics, um, there would be a, a fabrication space that would focus more on softer materials like fabric and those kinds of things. And those would also feed right into our performing and visual arts. Um, so those things really sort of nat naturally collaborate, you know, to build sets, to make costumes, those kinds of things for performances. Um, and really f um, are fed as well by the visual arts, which would be these classrooms up here. Um, our theater, we would expect to be about 750 seats. There would be 500 on the floor and then another 250 seat balcony. So this is obviously great for the performing arts students. A lot of our students really, um, that's how they engage best with the high school, is through those uh, performing arts classes and shows. It also, the 750 seat size would allow for more community use of our performing arts spaces. It would allow for slightly bigger shows. And the nice thing about, one of the many nice things about the design is that this sort of public area here can kind of be blocked off easily from our, our classroom wings. So when there are public performances or uh, public meetings and that kind of thing, people don't have to be circulating through some of our academic wings. The same goes for the physical education and athletic center. If we have you know, a track meet there on the weekend, for example, this door can be closed and that can kind of be housed over in the physical education and athletic center without having to open up the whole school during that event. These green spaces are dining commons. So each school would have its own dining commons, but they would share a kitchen and they would share infrastructure uh, for efficiency reasons. Um, anything that's sort of in light blue here are administrative spaces or guidance spaces. And of course, they each have their own separate ones. They each have separate entrances that kind of go right past the administration of each building. And we'll talk a bit about security in just a second. The orange spaces, as you've noticed with the Physical Education Athletic Center over at the high school, um, they're all athletic and wellness spaces. The middle school would have its own gym still with its own locker rooms. Both locker rooms would be on the same floor as the gym, which is different than what we have now. Um, it would have about the same number of seats as our current high school gym. So it doesn't need to be quite as big as our high school facilities, but it would allow enough space for parents and community members to actually watch a game. It would also allow our physical education uh, program to develop or to divide that space in half to sort of run simultaneous classes, which is a real challenge in our very small middle school gym right now. There we go. Um, and just another view of the extended learning areas, and I think that's on the board in the back as well, so I won't go over it too much, but these are just what some typical extended learning areas could look like. And this is what the inside of an extended learning area could look like. This is Gates Middle School in Situate, Massachusetts, which is one of the, the several schools that we visited as we were going through the phase two part of this study. So you can see kids at sort of a high top table working on one project. There's a little room back here uh, that can be used for small group work. Um, in our model, we also have those spaces um, as spaces potentially for special education or extra tutoring, those kinds of services, so they can be close by to the regular classrooms. There's nice passive supervision from the teachers out to this space, so the students know that they're kind of being watched, but they can also be working independently out here in the hallway together. 
The project has focused a lot from the beginning on sustainability. Um, our minimum goal for the project from the outset was to have a LEED certified project, um, and it really depends on how priorities are set in the rest of the design phase um, uh, in terms of what level LEED certification we would achieve. Um, the building is designed to be net zero ready, um, which means that it's ready to accept solar panels and those kinds of things. Um, the cost estimate um, for the current project does include some um, solar panels for sure, and then we'll have to talk about priorities amongst the list of things that, that may or may not end up in the final pro uh, project in terms of um, what level or how close we get to net zero, but there's more work to be done, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, a lot, we've tried to assure people that buildings aren't just demolished and put into landfills these days. So about 95% of most of Durham Whittier's projects go into different streams to be recycled or reused. Um, and then we did talk a little bit already about uh, efficient HVAC systems and things that would make the buildings more sustainable. People have asked us how much we expect in terms of efficiency. We really do need more space, um, and this is about a 50% increase in terms of square footage over what we have today. Um, the idea is that um, the systems would sort of put a cap on how much energy we're using and try to cap it at about where we are today, despite the big increase in square footage. Um, so lead certification, I won't go into all the details, but um, for any of you who know the lead process, um, it touches on a lot of different aspects of any building project. So transportation, um, site work, water efficiency, energy efficiency, all of those kinds of things. And Lee and Rob in the back can talk to you a little bit more about that if you have specific questions. Um, security obviously is forefront of everyone's minds these days as we talk about how schools are designed and how they work. Um, the studies that have been done recently, the white papers really show that the, the biggest, the most important thing uh, to prevent an incident at a school is to promote a sense of inclusiveness and community and make kids feel like they are not isolated. And that is a challenge that has, has gotten bigger for us as the school has become more and more crowded. Um, because there is not a lot of common space, there isn't a really great gathering space or a welcoming entryway for students, students kind of automatically splinter off into their various groups or isolate themselves entirely from other students during the day. And administration kind of has to work hard to make sure that they're not allowing that to happen in our current building. Um, the design will be compartmentalized so that different sections of the buildings can be closed off very quickly. Um, all of these windows, we've been asked about all these interior windows, um, they would be fitted with shades that could go down automatically once there's a panic button pressed. Um, there would be school guard glass, which is sort of one level below bulletproof glass um, in a lot of the different areas. And the main entryway, um, the main vestibule would be bulletproof glass, ballistic glass. Um, and really thoughtful egress, so exits from all of the parts of the, the building for safety. Again, Lee and Rob are the folks to talk about in more detail. This just sort of shows how the different compartments can be broken off from one, one another easily. And it shows we've really spent a lot of time talking to administration and the guidance teams and those kinds of, uh, of folks about the best way of designing an entrance and who needs to be sitting at that entrance and, and what the stages need to be to get into the buildings. So the board voted unanimously both in June and September to move this project forward. We really believe that it is the right project because doing nothing right now is just simply not an option. Um, it addresses issues that we've identified in a way that infrastructure only renovations, which are still very costly, cannot. Um, the new schools will support the educational model that is in place today and it will provide the flexibility to make changes in the future because of how the buildings are designed. It'll create more opportunities for aspects of technical education to come back on campus, which is great for the students who are planning to pursue a technical career. It's also great for students who are just hoping to integrate some of that technological education into their uh, wider program. Um, for those of you who have had students go through the system, you know that today is very focused um, in Vermont on personalized learning plans and really mapping your own path and your own way through school. And this will give folks, uh, give students another uh, set of options. Um, as I said before, this will integrate special education services much more seamlessly at the middle school. Um, I didn't focus too much on the pink spaces, but they're highlighted on the, the site plan in the back. All the pink spaces are special education spaces or spaces that can be used flexibly for special education or something else. Um, and the buildings will be safer and healthier and more accessible for both students and staff. 
um, and they'll be more in energy efficient than the current standards because we know that standards continue to evolve. They're designed to be out beyond what even today's uh, codes are. The Physical Education Athletic Center is really designed to give students physical activity and to help them really approach their health and wellness as adults do, which is to take responsibility for it and to try to fit in exercise where they can around their schedules. Um, and the increased size of athletic and performing arts spaces provide more opportunities, not only for our students, but also for the community to use those spaces. And finally, this project is the least disruptive for staff and students and will have the least chance of exposing them to hazardous materials during construction uh, versus renovation. So the cost, which I know is forefront in everyone's mind, the cost estimates were developed through a pretty detailed process. So September through November, the architects took this overall design and really developed schematic drawings and sent off a package of work, both to a professional cost estimator and also to a local construction company. And they did independent cost estimates uh, through the formulas that they usually use. Then in December, uh, we got those cost estimates the two different cost estimators sat down together and reconciled them and said, you know, hey, why is this one different? And sort of chose different features um, that were actually more likely after they had had discussion and came out with a cost estimate. Um, and through December and January, um, value engineering items were, were noted because the construction cost estimates uh, came in about $25 million higher than we were hoping. Um, through that detailed design process, talking with each of the faculty and staff and really digging in, there was more square footage in the project than we had initially planned for. Um, so basically that value engineering process was to identify buckets of things that could be taken out of the project. Um, those priorities are yet to be set, um, but there are at least $25 million of things that could come out of this initial estimate, I'm sorry, reconciled estimate of $199 million in construction cost. So taking out that $25 million of value engineering uh, potential items, we get to about $173 million in construction cost. The $36 million budget for soft costs includes everything um, that is that goes around a construction project. So that is um, furnishings, that is contingencies, that is general conditions that the contractor is going to charge while they're on site working. Um, those kinds of things are all wrapped up in that $36 million. Um, and then the total cost of the project comes out to about $209,588,000. After that, after that cost estimate uh, was reconciled and we got back to a project budget, we developed pa uh, tax impact assumptions with help from a financial advisor called Hilltop uh, Financial Advisor. They work with a lot of different school projects in different states. Um, and we've hired them to work on this project with us. So they developed different scenarios for how we would fund the project, different schedules for how we would, um, we would go out to the market to ask for bond funding. And we chose a scenario out of many of them that looked somewhat likely. So all of this is estimated. It's all based on what market conditions will potentially be. Um, it's hard to, you know, no one has a crystal ball, but this is our best estimate at the time. All of those costs of debt, so all the interest costs and repayment costs, were run through the tax formula that we use to get to the tax rate every year when we do our budget. Um, we used all the same factors that are going into the FY21 budget, so those factors that come from the state, like the CLA. Um, so we know for a fact, for the budget purposes, that the CLA is very low this year. The state decided to change that for South Burlington from 90, or 93% to 89% because houses are selling at much higher than they're assessed at the moment. Um, we used that formula to be conservative because we believe that at some point, especially after this reappraisal, that CLA uh, will, will head back northward. We use the same yield, we use the same estimated number of equalized pupils, which is a big one because we did not estimate that there was um, an increase in students' numbers, and we know that that is actually going to happen um, over the course of the 30 years that the bonds are out. Um, so we used income sensitivity um, to calculate uh, the income sensitivity formula for South Burlington and how that would be impacted. We worked with the state to determine how that formula would be impacted um, based on a project of this size and um, estimated both the impact for a homeowner um, who is not income sensitized and one uh, for a homeowner that is income sensitized. About 50% of South Burlington residents are eligible to pay uh, based on income sensitivity. 
um, whether they apply or not, we don't really have control, but about 50% of them should be applying for income sensitivity. Um, it's based on the income, uh, the impact, uh, excuse me, the impacts that we developed are based on a bond schedule that includes a bond anticipation note in the first year of the project, $10 million, and then a $67 million bond in the second year of the project. Um, that $10 million would be paid off by that $67 million um, bond, and then a $90 million bond and a $52.5 million bond issued um, just before uh, the last year of the project, the last year of the actual construction work. Um, as I said, the, con the calculations were not adjusted for any growth in the grand list of the state of Vermont. Um, it was uh, not uh, adjusted for growth in equalized pupils or a change in the CLA. Um, so I think a lot of you have probably seen these tables. They've been available online. They've been circulated at our board meetings. Um, there are two of them. There's one for homeowners who are not income sensitized. Um, the, the number that we have been sort of drawing out of this is the $1,500 on a property that is worth $350,000 because that's closest to what our average home value is in South Burlington. Uh, we've also been clear that um, in a couple of years, or not a couple, there are some years where it is higher than that average, that 1500 is an average over the 32 year life of the bond. And so those tables draw out what we estimate would be the impact in any given year. So it ranges from 624 when the first bond is out, um, the high point is right about the time the project is finished. Um, so that would be 2,143 and then the average over the whole bond would be about $1,500. For those on income sensitivity, um, we know that the, the median household income in South Burlington, the last time it was really calculated, uh, was about $66,000. So we looked at that 70,000 number as one of our touch points, uh, and we calculated an average tax impact over the 32 years of $438. So I've alluded to this a little bit in the presentation, earlier in the presentation, there is more design work to be done. So um, the project is roughly at the, at the stage that you send it out to get a cost estimate, um, it's about 30% designed. And so there's another year or so of detailed design work um, that would have community input, um, it would have uh, input from a lot of different people, and then there would be a construction bidding process that would happen right about the end of those 11 months, so that we would expect in February, March, sometime in that time frame of 2021, if we had a positive bond vote this year, that we would actually break ground. There would be about 32 months uh, involved in constructing the new buildings, and then somewhere between October of 2023 and January of 2024, students would move into those buildings from the high school and middle school, and then there would be another nine months or so of de uh, demolition of the existing buildings and the rebuilding of the playing fields with the hope that the project would be finished um, by uh, October of 2024. Um, so that is the initial phasing. Um, we really believe that this is the right time to do this project. Uh, we've been asked a lot about the timing of it. Um, there's been a long, thoughtful process that's gone into getting us where we are today and developing the proposal as far as it has been. Um, we know that construction costs are increasing faster than the rate of inflation, so we know that the longer we wait for this project, um, the, long, the more expensive it will be in real terms. Um, also, splitting the project into two or more smaller projects delays one portion of the, of the cost, and that cost uh, increases. So, for example, if we were to have a negative bond vote this time around and the project were delayed uh, by a little over a year um, because we wouldn't want to start construction. So for example, if we went and voted again in November on a different project, um, we would not want to start construction in November of a year. So it would be delayed even further into the spring of 2022, which would drive up cost by about $10 million because you're talking about an extra year of waiting to start that construction and construction costs will have gone up. So at that stage, we would be talking about having to take out $10 million of features from the project just to get back to our $209.6 million budget that we have right now. Um, addressing both schools at once reduces disruption to students who are on campus during construction. It's a big difference to have three, point, or three years and eight months of construction versus five years of construction. Um, the longer we wait, the more stewardship we have to continue to do on the middle school and high school. So major things like roofs and those kinds of things might need to be done um, if we continue to delay this uh, year after year. 
Right now, interest rates are pretty low, um, which is an advantage, obviously, and the overall cost of the debt service. And we're really already seeing increases in enrollment. So for example, just with the opening of that one building on Market Street that has affordable housing in it, we've had between 12 and 20 students, um, depending on uh, which, which estimate you look at, but we know that we've had um, a significant number of students just in the last couple of months come from that building. Um, this year's eighth grade class that's moving up to the high school next year um, is on track to be the biggest high school class that we've ever had in the history of South Burlington. Uh, we're seeing other signs like an 89 student kindergarten class at Orchard last year in terms of the number of kindergartners that come in. We're already seeing indicators that our enrollment um, projections are either coming true or may actually be a little <coughs> low on the low side. Um, and this project, we really believe as a board, would set the stage for the education of South Burlington's students uh, for the next several decades. And it will keep this community one that people want to live in, um, and it will contribute to the vibrancy of the community by drawing families who want to be here for the schools. So in terms of timing, uh, voting is on March 15th. The second meeting is on March 15th, and uh, very similar in structure to this one. We're basically just doing a repeat so that more people can come if they couldn't make it tonight. Um, that's on February 12th from 7 to 9 in the same place. Um, obviously, we'll have town meeting information night that will double as our hearing on the bond, the one that's required by law. So March 2nd at 7 p.m. at the middle school cafeteria, we'll have a hearing on the, the bond as well as our usual budget information, and we'll hear from uh, candidates for school board and city council, etc. Um, Pat Burke has very, and Karsten Schlenter have very generously donated their time um, to do drop-in tours every Tuesday and Friday morning between 7.30 and 8.30. Uh, they can't be here on February 11th, but other than that, you are welcome to drop in for a tour if you haven't uh, been through the high school or middle school in a while. Um, Pat is also going to be available during winter break uh, between the 24th and 28th of February and March 2nd itself um, but on at 1 and 5 p.m. So he'll do a much shorter version of a presentation. He doesn't talk nearly as much as I do. Um, and, um, and then he'll get on with the tour. Um, voting day, uh, town meeting day is March 3rd from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. at the regular polling places. Early voting starts at City Hall on February 12th, and they close that at March, on March 2nd at noon um, so they can get ready for um, town meeting day. And then absentee ballots will also be available starting February 12th, so people can request those at the city clerk's office um, or by calling them. And then, as David alluded to at the beginning, there is a project website um, that sort of collects all the information about the project at www.southburlingtonvtschools.com. So I'm happy to uh, just point you in the right direction again. Elizabeth and Brian and Alex and I will be up here to answer questions about what the board's process was. Um, there's an opportunity to talk to Pat Burke about school climate, about um, uh, the educational vision and the vision for athletics. Uh, the architects are in the back to talk more about the features of the schools. And Gary and David will be over here to talk about finances and taxpayer impact. So thank you for listening to that presentation.